Hello, and uh, a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us um, this evening for our inaugural seminar, which is part of our Hidden History series. Um, my name is Frizana Qureshi, and I am uh, an Arts and Humanities Librarian here at SOAS Library. Um, we're very excited to be hosting this series, uh, where we hope to share narratives and stories uh, for the Asia, Africa and Caribbean diaspora. I'm also uh, the co-chair of the SOAS Library Decolonization Operations Group. I'll hand over to Ludi. <clears throat> Hi, we're in the same room, so we might be gesturing to each other in case anyone's <laughs> wondering um, about that. Um, yes, my name is um, Ludi Price. I'm the China Librarian here at SOAS Library and also co-chair of the Decolonization Working Group. Um, and I can hear an echo for someone, would you mind? muting sorry so sorry <laughs> that's okay um so just a, a bit on um the hidden histories um seminar series that we've um got set up here and thank you all for coming to our inaugural session um so part of our goal as the SOAS library decolonization operational group is um to promote the decolonization of knowledge and part of that is decentering our Anglo-American or our Eurocentric ways of thinking. And um, it's really hard to do that without engaging with and learning about the hidden histories of communities outside of that Anglo-American and Eurocentric sphere. Um, so what we're aiming to do really with hidden histories is to bring these stories to the fore and to allow voices from Africa, Asia, the Middle East and their diasporas um, to be heard by everyone. Um, so we're really happy to kick off the first seminar in our series um, and we're really glad that it's coinciding um, with Black History Month um, and we'll be talking about um, Black British publishing and um, literature here so if you have any questions you can put, put them in the q a box and we'll be picking them up at the end of the seminar during the special q a section but in the meantime feel free to chat and discuss the talk with each other in in the chat um and i think that's all for housekeeping so um i'll hand you off to our lovely chair ida hajavayanis Sorry, I was muted there. Um, <laughs> hi, so my name is Ida Hajivayanis, and I'm lecturer um, here in the language, um, in, the, in the SLCL uh, at SOAS, so Africa section. And uh, okay, today I'll be chairing the event, which has been um, curated by the SOAS uh, Library Decoronation Operational Group. And this group is led by Fazana Kureshi, who we just met, Dr. Ludi Price, who just spoke before me, Ama Poku and Angelica Basquera. Um, so um, hidden histories uh, seek to highlight stories from um, African, Caribbean, and also Asian communities in the UK uh, and also beyond. So this brings to light a shared vision of decolonizing knowledge production and also documenting the unique voices and experiences of diasporas in Britain as well as across the world. Uh, so, in particular, to celebrate Black History Month, this is our inaugural session in the series, and it will explore Black literature movements, visual representations of Black figures, and also Black women in the academy. Uh, so tonight, we have a panel dis discussion with uh, Orela Yusuf, Huda Haire, uh, who are from uh, Thika Black Lines. Uh, and this is an interdisciplinary research-led artist collective that applies contemporary art, art theory, cultural studies, social practices to rewrite histories. Um, the group applies contemporary art um, theory. And uh, what Sika Black Lives uh, um, does is that um, it, it really sort of like um, looks okay, between the lines. And I'm sure that two of them will, 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 will talk more about this. But uh, Thicker Lines was initiated by Rihanna Jade Parker, as well as Orella Yusuf and uh, Huda Khaire, and also Karima Ali. Um, <clears throat> Orella Yusuf is a writer, an art historian. Her writing has appeared in Frise. I hope that's the I mean, correct pronunciation. She can co correct me later. Hyperallergic. Art Scope and also other art publications. She has worked with organizations including the Tate, 
um, Whitechapel Gallery, Photo Works, Hauser and Worth, Glasgow Art School, and many, many more. Aurela is a founding member of the Interdisciplinary Art Collective, Pika Black Lines, uh, which is why she's here today. And she's also the convener of Kitchen Table Crypt, uh, which is a monthly peer forum for Black artists, critics, and curators. Huda Khaire is an independent researcher and artist with a background in public international law. Her practice focuses on the position of Black people globally. And um, she has shared uh, work at the Tate Museum, sorry, Tate Exchange, uh, Tate Modern and um, Uncommon Space at Tate Britain. So there's three types of Tates going on there. Um, she can tell us more about it later, I'm sure, if we are interested. Um, she's also worked for the uh, Prince of Rotterdam, She's in Hale Gallery and DIY Cultures. Huda is, is part of the Black Feminist Artist Collective, Pika Black Lines, as well as an associate of Numbi Art and OOMK Zain. She's also founding member of the Somali Museum. Um, I'd like to know more about that, I'm sure. Uh, we also have Dr. Marlene uh, Edwin, who is Deputy Director of the Center for Caribbean and Diaspora Studies at Goldsmith University of London. That's our sister university. Uh, Dr. Marlene Edwin is currently engaged um, in research on creolistics uh, and also oral literature. She's also the convener and postgraduate um, uh, okay, module uh, convener for literature of the Caribbean and its diaspora. And she also teaches the MA in Black British, British literature. I think that's it uh, for me. Uh, so I will start by welcoming um, Huda and Aurela, who will, uh, who, I mean, who will offer us their presentation now. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, thank you for that introduction and uh, thank you for inviting us to be um, a part of this um, first panel uh, of the Hidden History series. Um, my name is Aurelia Youssef and I'm here with Huda Keira um, and along with Rihanna J. Parker and Karima Ali, we are um, an interdisciplinary artist and research collective called Thicker Black Lines um, and our work has been primarily concerned with um, Black art in Britain and, and how that fits more widely into the conditions of Black life and, and knowledge production and how all of these things um, intersect. So today we are going to be um, talking about Black British publishing. Um, I'm going to start with, um, I guess, a, a few highlights from, from the history of Black British publishing um, through into um, the present day and um, how, how the publishing industry independently and uh, in the major sort of publishing sector has developed over time, um, but also looking at um, the role of audiences and readership um, within that, and also um, looking at our work um, in Thicker Black Lines as a kind of case study for um, working with audiences. Um, so with that, I will... Um, begin our slideshow and I will um, hand over to Huda to begin the discussion. Thank you so much Aurela and thank you Ida for that really generous introduction. Um, I hope throughout this presentation we will have an understanding of how complex the discourse of decolonization, whatever there may be, will look like um, through actually taking you know, as as uh, Ludi uh, spoke about having a sort of a, a pulling out to look at the 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 origins of as to how uh, the colonial world was formed and knowledge production is primary vehicle by which we can understand the colonial power operated but also um, to introduce another languaging coloniality to take the words of um, Latin American theorist uh, Animal Keanu, um, the continuation of colonial uh, power structures despite the end of formal colonization. And so Thicker Black Lines have been engaged in a discourse looking at the written word, looking at books specifically and libraries and how they are both sites of the, ex, um, the display of colonial power, but also sites of uh, counter narratives and counter resistance. And so throughout our presentation, Aron and I will look at the complexities of understanding what would decolonized text look like and 
thinking about things in terms of the present uh, present day and the and and the, the sort of strides that communities have taken from the past but going back to sort of like what are we talking about when we're talking about publishing we are thinking about the the spread of the written word and the primacy of the written word and the legitimacy of the written word written word over other forms of narration such as oral um, testimony oral histories um, and specifically the primacy of European languages and English language. So this, this whole um, conversation is, is limited to um, texts that are written in English, um, even from authors that um, had uh, different languages as their, as, their, as their primary tongue, because language was a display of, of power. Um, if we go back all the way to sort of what we understand this colonial world to be, um, Thicker black lines think out specifically the conditions of black peoples um, across the, uh, glo the globe. And when we're thinking about the histories of black peoples vis-a-vis -vis British um, culture and history, we must think back to 1492. We must think back about the um, creation of the new world and the colonial adventure, which was always for African peoples, a negotiation around uh, enslavement. And the laws around the capacity of enslaved peoples to read and write and to learn are really underpin how we can think about the responses of black British people um, in, the, uh, in going forward and how to think about um, our relationship with, in, in, within publishing. And so in the colonial uh, world system, African peoples were not allowed to read and write, and this was punishable. Nonetheless, we saw the written word be used as a vehicle to, for um, the explanation of, of, of the, 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 the grandeur, the, um, both the, the, the systems of, of enslavement, but also um, thinking about the uh, humanity of enslaved peoples. And so um, thicker black lines, um, sort of when we're thinking about sort of th these histories, we, we're looking back even to the first text written by black peoples that were made available in, in England, um, such as the work of people like Oloda Ekwano and uh, Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley's work was published in London in, 19, in 1774 um, after a, uh, a, a tour of her, of her, her works. She was a captive African um, who uh, found herself, was, was taken to Boston and um, was able to um, nonetheless learn to read and write and speak about her story directly and um, was able to uh, take her um, herself and, and with uh, the abolitionist movement was able to, to, to arrive in London and have a court with the mayor of, uh, of, of London at the time and even the, uh, the, the royalty at the time and knew her work and, and, and her prowess, not only as a, a skilled poet, but also her actual biography, her story. And so the slave narrative was a, a primary vehicle when British publishing thought about the stories of African peoples. Um, this is a more autonomous conversation or about um, uh, the story of African peoples in um, uh, uh, and black peoples in in British publishing. Um, nonetheless, the as we sort of will, will talk about this, the story of autonomy is always a, a very fragile um, conversation. Um, this uh, within the context of, 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 of slavery, um, the capacity of black peoples to um, was doubted in, in order in the, for black people to actually um, be understood as, as literary people. And in a culture that was um, vast, um, the publishing houses were vastly becoming the, the sites of knowledge production, whether it be attached to the university or the um, more the, the, the independent um, publishing houses of Bloomsbury and, and Heinlein and so on. Um, the narratives that those publishing houses shared of, of black peoples across the globe, whether it be in the Caribbean or the UK or, or in Africa, was, an, was a narrative and a discourse that was um, on the whole part incredibly disparaging. We can think to um, the, the work of, of the a famed author, um, Joseph Conrad and the Heart of Darkness, but even um, a sort of our more, um, what we would say are um, sort of our best sellers and our favorite authors, people like Agatha Christie, her um, best selling text published in 1939, um, originally was entitled something incredibly inflammatory. It was, it was changed to, um, uh, and then there were none. And to this day, it's still um, Agatha Christie's a best selling text and one of the best selling texts in the English language. Nonetheless, the, the, the um, 
the propagation of um, defamatory uh, words um, uh, for black peoples was in the common vernacular. And this type of um, orientalizing it's in, in some uh, narratives or just or in, in, in other ways to say um, the depiction of black peoples in, in, in negative terms uh, was replete within um, the, the, the English canon. And this were, were acceptable um, texts to be published. Um, and so during um, the, up until the mass immigration of, of black peoples to the UK from um, 1948 onwards, um, the, there was a, from, from the outset, there was a great move to um, redress these negative discourses on, on black peoples. And so one case study that uh, we'll sort of speak through is uh, Britain's first black uh, um, publishing house um, New Beacon Books. The impetus behind the um, publishing house and the um, uh, ecosystem to which that uh, publishing house was, was created, to think more about what is it that we're thinking about when we're thinking about publishing and its social impact and how do we understand the, the experience of Black peoples. And so um, the founder of New Beacon Books, um, author John LaRose, came to the UK in 1961, um, as many um, Caribbean peoples did. Um, he, he was originally from Trinidad to study, and he found himself in a cohort of um, uh, artists, writers, theorists, thinkers, um, who were challenging the colonial system in this milieu of anti-colonial movements. And Britain, uh, from the interwar years onwards, was a, a hotbed by which um, anti-colonial fervor and, and, and movement was, was being um, sort of established, um, founded the Caribbean Artist Movement. Um, the Caribbean Artist Movement um, had a publication, the CAM, a, 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 um, a regular publication, as well as having regular meetings by where authors and writers were able to share their texts. In 1966, John LaRose established New Beacon Books. New Beacon gained its name from Beacon Publication, which was a, 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 um, a West Indian publication um, that had writers like um, uh, Alfred Gomez and, um, and CLR James, and was a, um, a, a publication that was thinking about the, the unity of of the Caribbean, which under uh, the colonial system, the um, islands were, um, the means of communication between islands were in in incredibly severed. And knowledge production was focused on the colonial metropole. So authors and writers and peoples, and this is not exclusive to the Caribbean, this is across the colonized, all the, the, the nations, particularly that Britain had colonized that uh, knowledge production was, was focused in, in Britain and disseminated to the, the colonized peoples and, the, and the, the space by which peoples were able to speak to themselves in the written form was incredibly limited. John LaRose has a, a really uh, heartfelt um, um, sort of analysis of this time um, when he says of this, uh, of, the, of growing up in the colonial period, he said, growing up in the colonial society in the Caribbean made me acutely aware of the colonial policy that was based on withholding information from the population. There was a discontinuity of information from generation to generation. Publishing, therefore, was a vehicle to independent validation of one's own culture, history, and politics, a sense of self, and to make, um, and make a break with discontinuity. So we see from the outset, New Beacon Books had, some could argue, um, a, a decolonizing uh, modus, a, a methodology, a way of thinking about this, this newly nascent form of, of the Caribbean, of the West Indian, bringing together these people um, from uh, in, in the disparate islands that, um, that were, were created disparate by the colonial system. Um, and as well as re responding to the lived reality of people who were um, away from home and making Britain their home. New Beacon Books had its headquarters in uh, Stroud uh, Green Road in um, Binsby Park. Um, and it was literally based from his, his uh, John LaRose's bedsit they shared with his partner, Sarah, uh, Sarah White. Um, the Caribbean artist movement would have regular meetings in spaces like the West Indian uh, Student Center that was based in Els, uh, Els Court, but also many other places. 
um, and they published the works of fellow writers in the movement, such as Edward Kamal Braithwaite, the John LaRose's poetry himself, as well as factual, uh, um, as well as um, factual text, um, uh, and the so New Beacon's bestseller was a um, a pamphlet by uh, Bernard Cord um, called "How the uh, West Indian Child Is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British Education System." Um, I'm saying this from memory. I should look at the text title directly. But this book was New Beacon Books bestseller and was directly speaking to the challenges that black children, Caribbean children specifically were facing in British education system that was purposefully denying resources to children and branding them as educationally subnormal um, because they were not born in the UK. Um, even if they came from homes where English was the uh, primary language. Um, other really beautiful texts that um, New Beacon Books uh, published were um, on the on the, uh, the creation of, of, of Creole grammar, um, and this text looked uh, took a, a scholarly uh, review of, um, of, of of Creole languages um, in the Caribbean and specifically addressing the um, the hierarchy of English and English uh, established uh, language that um, that that was prevalent in the academy and in in British culture that understood. Um, uh, um, the, uh, the language spoken in, in the Caribbean as being a, a, a sort of a, a, a pidgin English, a lesser version, as opposed to a, um, a language with a coherent uh, a grammar system, and one that was um, unique to its locale, not something that was derivative of, of English culture, as it were. And so um, the 1960s and 70s saw um, an upswell of, of independent publishing houses, including um, not only New Beacon Books, um, but also um, the uh, 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 Bogle Literature um, Bookshop um, that was established by the, the Huntley family, and uh, as well as uh, uh, publishing houses like, um, the, um, such as the work created by um, Margaret Busby. So, there was this uh, moment, this, this, this period where publishing was understood as an important vehicle for um, not only uh, countering um, racist anti-Black narratives about um, Black peoples in the UK, but also as an as a ecosystem to support creative works by um, Black writers in the UK. Um, and one that was also um, created in, in partnership with bookshops, but as well um, uh, even in international book fairs. And so one of the sort of key um, uh, moments in the history of New Beacon Books was the establishment of the Black and International, a Third World International Book Fair that um, was a three-day book fair that invited authors from across the world um, and was a nexus point for the sharing of, of information and um, uh, as well as authors having a direct relationship with their audiences. Um, Sorry, everyone, I've been trying to uh, share slides and I don't think they're showing up. <laughs> Do you know what we will we will share the slides afterwards? But yeah, I just to to sort of like um, to close out. So many of the the um, the activist groups that were established in the UK, such as OAD, the Organization of Women of African Asian Descent, um, had uh, publications attached to um, their work. So Speak Out magazine was a publication by which. Um, works were being able to be shared. Um, in the 1980s, um, publish, um, there was a, a, a move by um, publishing houses that although were not um, established by uh, Black writers and authors, were concerned with and disseminated the work of, of, of Black writing. Um, the Women's Press, which was an imprint of Virago, um, 
uh, was the first public uh, first uh, press in the UK to share the work of Alice Walker's Color Purple, and were also um, the first publishers of a, a really important landmark text called The Heart of the Race. Um, that was a, a text of a, a sociological, ostensibly a sociological overview of the experiences of black women in Britain that was overseen by and, and, and written by uh, Beverly Bryan, Stella Dadzi and, and Susan Scarf. And we're going to talk more about that text later. Um, but independent self-publishing has also been at the, at the heart of, 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 black, um, of, of Black British publishing, the story of Black British publishing. And so um, finally on the screen, we have uh, Passions, a discourse on Black women's creativity that was um, created by um, uh, Red uh, Urban Fox um, uh, Publications, which was an independent um, venture by the artist Maud Sorter and uh, Lubaina Himid, and is to this day the only uh, text that is um, um, exclusively about the work of Black British uh, female artists. And um, so you can see that Black British art, um, publishing was very much drawn from a necessity, and the um, the ecosystem that um, created um, these these independent publishing houses um, that. Uh, were involved, were very much led by by audiences and by by uh, sort of uh, um, the word that we were using was symbiotic relationship between the needs of the community and the, the readership and the and the um, the creativity of of the authors that that um, to able to show that they that they they at least um, that many times in in British cultural life there has been this 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 deep conversation. So I want us to have this in our minds when we're thinking about sort of the, the present day um, examples of what we're thinking about when thinking about Black British publishing and how that relates to this convers wider conversation that, that this um, seminar is having around decolonizing knowledge and, and what would that look like. So I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague um, Arella now to share her parts. Yeah, so thank you, Hedda. Um, and I think, we're going to take a bit of a leap into the present day, but um, the reason why um, these two books are so significant to us as um, Flick of Black Lines, um, as, as, uh, as readers, um, is because, as Huda said, Passion um, is still to date the only um, book that has been specifically about Black women artists, and Heart of the Race is. Uh, both books were out of print for a long time. Heart of the Race was republished um, a couple of years ago, and we'll talk a bit about that now. But the fact that um, books that are so uh, landmark can be um, out of print and unavailable for such a long time is um, something that's really important to remember when we think about the kind of progress that's been seen to be made in, in mainstream publishing. And particularly when we think that over the years, of the decades really since these books came out to now, there have been a number of, of Black writers who have, have come to prominence, um, but there hasn't really been that huge um, shift in the overall industry. Um, but we are seeing a few initiatives in recent years that, that um, have been coming after increasing pressure because I think everyone might have noticed like year on year, there are these kind of reports um, that, that are published about the industry um, really stating um, in, in cold hard figures, um, the, the lack of diversity in um, behind the scenes, but also as far as writers, um, whether it's in academic publishing, in uh, fiction, non-fiction, children, children's and young adult literature um, and also in journalism and mainstream media um, and a few initiatives that, that have, have um, been established in recent years are um, in 2018 um, Murky Books was an imprint um, is an imprint of uh, Penguin which was created um, actually um, by the rapper Stormzy so I think that's also something that's interesting because the, the impetus for this is actually coming outside of the industry. Um, and, and I believe he also, um, you know, is the, is the primary like financial backer of this. 
Um, and although this isn't um, a, an imprint that um, focuses exclusively on black authorship, um, it has um, a purpose for writers coming from um, different underrepresented marginalized backgrounds. And then um, also by Jacaranda, there was this um, initiative um, called 20 in 2020, um, in which they um, sought to publish 20 books by new um, or perhaps previously unpublished writers, um, which um, covered uh, the majority fiction, but also poetry and nonfiction. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we are seeing, um, but they're, I think what they indicate is that although there is um, there is a tendency within mainstream publishing for um, these kind of initiatives to receive a lot of um, a lot of press, um, the 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 actual push is not coming from within the industry, um, and it's actually coming from pressure either by audiences, uh, by the general public, or by writers themselves. And last year in uh, twenty twenty. Um, following the global uprisings um, that we saw um, in, in really every area of society that was spurred on by um, violence and uh, police brutality in the United States, but actually more widely. Um, this, this kind of had a huge ripple effect on lots of different um, areas of society and industries and um, led to the establishment of the Black Writers Guild in the UK, in which 200 um, Black British writers um, across different um, sectors came together to really put pressure on the industry to improve uh, the visibility, um, the diversity and representation of Black voices in publishing in, and in the media. Mm. Um, but I think the, the difference between these kind of initiatives and what we saw with uh, New Beacon Books and uh, the movements of the 60s, 70s and 80s is this, uh, like Huda said, this symbiotic relationship between the writers and the audiences that it was very much a kind of community based um, platform in which there was a direct relationship between um, what audiences wanted. Um, and what you'll find now is that um, publishers have an expectation that um, writers are already quite established before they will even um, allow them to publish through a major, um, one of the major five publishing houses. Um, there's an expectation that, that they already are, are fairly, uh, have a voice within their community that are well known. Um, and frequently this, this has an impact on the type of um, publications that we're seeing. So um, a lot of the um, a lot of the new writing that we're seeing is coming from the sphere of journalism, of um, social justice activism, and so what this creates is um, a kind of a, an imbalance where there is a lot of nonfiction writing being produced, um, and this is separately to academic publishing. Um, but we're not necessarily seeing um, the same amount of fiction and um, the, the type of writing that, that can really um, enrich um, and have a really nuanced understanding of the world, um, especially for young readers. And I think when, when we think about some of the um, greatest Black writers um, globally, and think of people like James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Chinua Achebe, we don't necessarily require um, only non-fictional text to represent our lives and our experiences when actually we can get deep, just a deep understanding from also fiction and having those two things going together um, is really really important so um, something that is that is not as visible um, is, is kind of spaces for the development of creative writing um, that that simply doesn't get the same kind of traction that, that um, in, in this moment in time, in, in the social climate, that, that nonfiction gets. Um, and so what this leads to is audiences and readerships um, only having access to the kind of books that are essentially given to them. And um, 
when we were talking about this, we just, we felt that it was really, really important that um, audiences actually develop like a, a, a sophisticated understanding of what they want because they also have the power to demand um, more variety, more of, of everything that they want really, um, where we can have really layered and rich understandings of our lives and of our experiences and, and not just have to accept whatever is presented to us. Um, but audiences don't necessarily have the confidence to do that if they don't have the space um, to read slowly and think together and ask questions um, because uh, reading can be quite um, a solitary endeavor but it can also be something communal and that's something that we have found um, very important um, in our work as Thicker Black Lines. Um, in 2017, we had a residency at Tate Exchange in Tate Modern. Um, and as part of that residency, we had a series of public programming. Um, one of the events was um, uh, essentially a pilot for a bigger project later on. And it was a reading group around um, Heart of the Race, the book that we mentioned earlier. Um, at the time, this book was still, um, uh, hadn't been republished. Um, so the, the copy had were, um, I think, ex library copies that were circulating on Amazon. And uh, it was it was really um, a really rewarding kind of close reading. Um, and it was it was quite transformative for some of the members of the public who um, joined us on that day, um, where we, we um, looked at one chapter of the book. Um, subsequently, the book was republished by Verso um, in 2018, and we were invited to do um, a, a longer project um, in which we um, had a five week reading group each week focusing on one chapter. Um, and it, this was open to a much larger, um, uh, large, a larger audience um, where we had um, sort of 40 or 50 people with us every week from the general public across um, all ages, um, genders, backgrounds. Um, it was, it was the, I think the most remarkable thing was that people would return week after week. It wasn't just sort of a drop in and, and leave it at the end of the session, but there was that commitment. Um, and I think um, it, was, it was one of the occasions where we felt we were actually having the opportunity to um, read with people, to think ideas through about society, about, um, about life, because although our work focuses on artists, you can't understand um, the conditions of, of art production, standing the conditions of black life in this country. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Huda to talk a bit more about the, the longer reading group that we had, and then I think we will wrap up after that. Yeah, thank you so much, Arella. So, um, when we're thinking about publishing, um, libraries as a as a consumer of published works and as a a, um, a forum by which public uh, uh, works can be be read and a physical venue for um, for community readings, um, we created a little library. I don't know if you can see that there in in the uh, in the picture and think of black lines actually is involved in a lot of sort of create library creation and creating reading uh, reading uh, lists for for example the the turner prize in 2018 but also um and with the uncommon space at the the uh, the, the tate in in pimlico and um the the library that we created um during the um our residency at, at <coughs> tate um tate exchange and um, because we think that you cannot have a conversation about uh, British publishing without thinking about the conditions of libraries and the reality that uh, many people um, in terms of the readership may not be people who um, buy books, but certainly have um, require access to books. And um, rather than libraries um, being a space that um, diminishes the impact of, of, of text and literature because um, you know, they're, they're not this kind of consuming public as it were. Um, I know my lived experience, and I think many of us, we can have that conversation on, on later, the libraries have been the primary place for which we've learned about um, uh, works. 
And we're also really interested in terms of thinking about Black British publishing, um, the, the culture of creating personal libraries. One of the things that we found really um, remarkable in our research around Black British publishing is how much um, communities were reliant on peoples who had extensive book collections and the capacity for communities to share texts um, together that were outside of the um, sort of the mainstream um, uh, British publishing um, houses, um, a publishing house that has been discriminatory um, towards telling stories of, of black peoples in a way that has been um, supportive, rich and empowering, um, despite sort of the many sort of movements and overs towards um, more diversity and equality. Um, community libraries, um, the, the creation of informal networks of, of knowledge, not only a knowledge dissemination, but even knowledge production through um, independent publications like zines, like pamphlets, like magazines. Um, and Black British organizing has been focused around as well, dissemination of knowledge through the printed text. And these formal publications, I think, can't be um, uh, diminished and so much of the work that has informed Thicker Black Lines and informed our reading of The Heart of the Race was from these informal networks of, of knowledge production. And I think that uh, returning back to the sort of um, the Fran Lubowitz quote that Aurora and I sort of uh, also wanted to open out to um, our, uh, our fellow people on, on the Zoom, thinking about what discernment we have when thinking about what type of books we want. Um, what is our le leisure level of connoisseurship? Um, what are our tastes? Um, and um, there is a, there can be a, um, a, a, a sort of a, almost a pessimistic reading of Black British publishing if you think about sort of the types of texts that were created in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, like Walter Rodney is how um, Africa's made, um, was undeveloped. Um, or so these these texts that supported um, uh, intellectual work in the communities um, on texts that were um, that to this day we still find incredibly nourishing. Um, we'd like to open up to the audience to think about what is their experience of Black British um, uh, writing, but also what is it that you're looking for, especially in these in these times um, of global upheaval and climate crisis catastrophe and the ongoing violence that um, black peoples face, not just in the UK from police violence, but across the world. What type of literature, what type of um, text would be um, appropriate for this time and what we need from this time? Um, yeah, so um, I think I'll close there and apologies if we've overrun, um, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear the, the conversation that we'll have afterwards. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you very, very much to both of you, Huda and uh, Aurela. That was very stimulating. I'm sure we'll have some uh, some, some good discussions later. So uh, I'll just quickly say, like, as you were talking, Huda, I was, uh, when you spoke about how, how reading was not um, a privilege that many could have, I was thinking of, of the latest, of the, of the most recent Nobel of, of laureate, Abdurazak Gurna, and, and he writes in, in Afterlives uh, about a girl called Afia who, who learns to read. And uh, as soon as her uncle finds out, he, he smacks her. He really, he beats her up so much until okay, she breaks her, as in like her arm. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing that actually happened on the coast of East Africa, which was seen as, an, as a cosmopolitan um, area. So we can discuss all this later. And again, interestingly, I mean, Gurna also wrote Paradise, which is a response to, um, to, to uh, Heart of Darkness. So we can also look at this later. Um, Aurela, you, your talk on the imbalance of, of what is being published in terms of fiction and nonfiction, I think is very interesting in how the nuance is, is reaching um, those that are being targeted. But we can discuss all this after we hear from um, uh, Dr. Marlene Edwin. Who will uh, who, oh, please? I mean, it's like you, you're welcome to present your presentation. Thank you very much, both of you. I loved your talk. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen, and hopefully, if you give me a thumbs up, 
I will know um, if it's working. So one second. Uh, let me make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Uh, I think. Okay. Can oh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Great. And it's not the one with my emails on it. Okay. No. It's <laughs> Okay, great. I'd just like to um, thank um, Fazana and Ludi and the team for inviting me to be um, a part of um, the, your Hidden History um, series. So my talk this afternoon is titled The Longest Journey, Black Women in the Academy, Our Story, Her Story, My Story. And um, it focuses on my particular journey into the academy alongside my interactions with the Centre for Caribbean and Diaspora Studies, which I will refer to as SEEDS at Goldsmiths, and the recently retired and um, professor, Joan Annie Maddo, who's also the director of the centre. And I have taken the title of my talk from the title of um, her book, The Longest Journey, A, A History of Black Lewisham. Um, so, Firstly, how did I get here? And by here, I mean within the academy. So my background is such that I left school and went straight into work. When I started working at Goldsmiths, I did not have a degree. And in the summer of 2004, a pamphlet landed on my desk and I was immediately intrigued. Could there possibly be such a thing as an MA in Caribbean literature and Creole poetics? In all of my primary and secondary education, I'd never been told that other literatures existed besides that prescribed on the school curriculum. This was my first introduction to Animado, who would later become not only my mentor and colleague, but also a valued friend. Animado arrived in the UK at the age of 13 and, and through a strong sense of self and a very strong sense of place, she became a teacher. She survived the UK education system because of her curiosity and love of literature. The history of the Centre for Caribbean and Diaspora Studies and its current activities place it at the forefront of Caribbean related studies in the UK and beyond. The centre was responsible for the first London conference of Caribbean women's writing in 1994 and signalled an inclusivity for those in the diaspora studying this body of work as an academic discipline and this text on your screen, Framing the Word, was an output from that um, particular conference. So I became a member of the centre in 2004, and I am currently the deputy director. In line with the impetus for Caribbean courses to be made available in higher education institutes, 2004 saw SEEDS launch the first programme of its kind in the UK, and that is the MA that I referred to earlier. And so this postgraduate degree programme developed student specialist knowledge and critical understanding of Caribbean literature in English and in English translation. The programme also covered the evolution of Caribbean Creoles, in part by looking at the impact of West African based Creoles on the Caribbean and the resulting literature. The cohort of students to which I was one of the first consisted of three full-timers and one part-timer, and we were to become what I call the first community of learners, or as Patrick Joyce names us, liberal citizens. And we would set up the monthly Caribbean forum to open out discussion to a wider group. So whilst still a postgraduate student, I organized two challenging and thought-provoking symposia in 2005, which provided time and space for issues of Caribbean and diaspora studies, illustrating an important direction for the centre and Goldsmiths, developing the Caribbean voice, both locally in Lewisham, nationally and internationally. Academics researching the field had much to say about the symposium, and there are a couple of quotes here um, on the slide where they're just talking about the conference providing a telling opportunity of what the center can contribute to an institution like Goldsmiths, which provides, prides itself in being a creative, innovative place, offering a truly interdisciplinary ethos. And then further, uh, Giovanna Covey from the University of Trento stated, I think this sets a benchmark that other institutions might successfully follow. It is also rare for such a small event to open up to non-anglophone perspectives and to include scholars from different disciplines and do full justice to the field of Caribbean studies, which cannot possibly be tackled otherwise. So both of these quotes illustrate the effect that SEEDS had and continues to have on the academy. 
the recommendations for a strong Caribbean centre and the much needed forum given in 2005 are as relevant today as they were 16 years ago in arguing for a raised visibility of Caribbean studies as a discipline and Caribbean research centres in general. My student journey continued as Annie Maddow encouraged me to undertake a PhD, all while working full time with two kids, but she encouraged me and um, I did it and was successful. And so during that time, SEEDS organised numerous conferences, um, a few of which I'm going to just talk about very briefly here. So 2007, with its centennial focus on the abolition of the slave trade and its impact on the Atlantic world, including slave colonies of the Caribbean, was no better year in which to further de the debate concerning Caribbean women's writing. Specifically, the conference theme at that time was writing, diaspora, and the legacy of slavery. And it sought to embed the central motif of burden of production, reproduction, which fell to African Caribbean women in the immediate aftermath of abolition and to extend this to contemporary issues of writing and representation within the region and the diaspora. Assuming Creole culture to be a significant part of the legacy of Atlantic slavery, meanings of creolization inscribed within artifacts of the culture were fruitfully read. The conference was attended by some 50 delegates from as far afield as Australia, the US and Barbados. Similarly, uh, in June 2011, we had a further International Caribbean Women's Writing Conference titled Comparative Critical Conversations. And this, uh, we were reminded in our keynote lecture at that time, um, that of the reminded that the audience of the need to become comparatists in order to allow the body of work that is Caribbean women's literature to quote, find a room of its own. Discussions on issues concerning affect and queer poetics, as well as female subjectivity and gender relations, led to further debates on spoken word, auto theorizing and diasporic remembering. The significance of this conference is that through the, the construction of the conference website, the essence of the conference has been captured and archived, resulting in a visual and acoustic cataloging of events which make up this creolized archive. So further in 2011, we received funding for an AHRC project titled Beyond, Beyond the Looking Glass, Other Cultures Within Translating Cultures. And it brought together leading academics from 10 universities and employed methods and perspectives from across the fields of literature, museum studies, linguistics, history, sociology, and anthropology to examine the determinants and impact of the con construction of cultural identity and the act of translation as collaboration and shared knowledge. The group's collective transnational scholarship highlighted a rich theme of cultural translations in the relative and related intersections of creolization. Britishness and global English of interest to scholars, teachers, creative artists, museum educators and education professionals. The proposal premised on translation as collaboration and shared interdisciplinary knowledges gathered researchers whose collective scholarship is grounded in transnational discourse and intersected theoretical questions on the complexities of cultural translation. Aimed at critically, critically questioning meanings of cultural translation by regarding first texts marked by creolization, a discourse originated through intercultural exchanges. Out of this research network emerged two further international conferences, one in the Library of Congress in Washington in 2012, and the second took place in London titled Perspectives from Other Cultures, Translating Cultures. So it's useful to return to the primary sources, that of the conference program, not only to reconstruct the disciplinary past, but to teach it to the next generation of scholars. Through this micro history, the added value of studying these sources in their original context is revealed. Micro histories are distinctive in the incorporating both emic and etic perspectives. The international conference series, both at home and abroad, represents what microhistorians call the exceptional normal, and that is an event or practice that viewed in the context of modern scientific inquiry seems exotic, remarkable, or marginal, but that when properly investigated, that is placed or coded in its proper context, reveals its own logic and order. 
As such, microhistory does not narrate the normal or describe the exceptional, but rather it interprets their relationship, shedding light on the normal and lending more than anecdotal significance to the exceptional. The conference I spoke about above, and indeed SEED's conference series, are examples of the microhistorical concept of the exceptional normal and can be read as an interaction ritual. Collins defines interaction ritual as an instance of mutually focused emotion and attention, producing a momentarily shared reality, which thereby generates solidarity and symbols of group scholarship. He highlights four factors that constitute an interaction ritual, group assembly, a barrier to outsiders, mutual focus and a shared mood. All of these can be applied to SEED's international conference series. That is to say that combined, these factors lead a group to develop a rhythmic coordination and synchronization to their conversation. And as such, participants get, quote, caught up in the rhythm and mood of the talk. By describing these conferences through the template of Collins Interaction Ritual, I assimilate it to normal intellectual practices in academic disciplines. Yet on each occasion, core participants return to engage in rhythm and mood of the talk, embodying their own identities and uniqueness of SEED's conference series. It is the chronotype that defines the event or series of events and its written documents as exceptional. And to my knowledge, the SEED's conference series was the first of its kind in London to focus on Caribbean women's writing and continues to do so. So then just to move on briefly to Black British Publishing, and both um, Aurella and Huda have spoken about um, New Beacon Press and there's all People Tree and Dialogue. Um, I want to make reference to a very, very small um, press, Manga Publishing, which was uh, founded by um, Joan Annie Maddow. So not only was she, is, or is she the uh, director for the Centre for Caribbean and Diaspora Studies, but she also had um, a small press um, and the inspiration for the founding of Mango was as a result of the first Caribbean Women's Writers Conference, the one that I referred to um, earlier on. And this conference itself gave birth to the Caribbean Women Writers Alliance, a collective of mainly but not exclusively Black women. The CWWA provided a forum for dialogue and a space in which new forms of writing were produced by those whose voices had been marginalised. A primary motivation for founding this small press was to provide the opportunities for these, for these new writers to have their voices heard. The CWWA held workshops, conferences and local library readings and recognised the need for books that would speak to the communities in which they were operating. Under the umbrella of Mango Publishing, 1994 saw the launch of Mango Season. Caribbean Women's Writing, a journal published four times a year, giving voice to the CWWA. The literary magazine included creative writing, literary criticism and reviews. Mango remained committed to this vision, publishing its first anthologies of short stories and poetry, Mango and Spice, in 1995, and Voice, Memory and Ashes, also in 1995, followed by Jacob Ross's fine collection of short stories, A Way to Catch the Dust, in 1999. Concerned with creating literary space for women writers, Mango published new names together with internationally known and award-winning writers such as Beryl Gilroy, Velma Pollard and Alba Ambert. As an independent publisher of fiction and poetry by writers of Caribbean and Hispanic heritage, Mango soon added works of literary criticism to its catalogue. An interest in the wealth of fine writing from the Hispanic world often inaccessible in the United Kingdom, led Mango to develop a series of bilingual works. This included poetry, uh, My Last Name and the Great Zoo by Nicolas Guillén of Cuba, regarded by critics as one of the finest of the region, and Nancy Morion's Black Women and Other Poems, an internationally acknowledged Cuban poet. Among other works in this series are books of short stories by Brazilian and Cuban women. A new series focusing on Black British writers included Thelma Perkins' Roundabouts in 2002 and Cherish in 2003 by Yinka Sunmonu. A number of Mango publications received international acclaim, including Limbo Lands by Maggie Harris, which was awarded the Guyana Prize for Literature in 2000. And in 2003, Spirit of Haiti by Miriam Chancy was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for the best first work of fiction. 
In 2007, Mango Season was relaunched as New Mango Season, the Journal of Caribbean Women's Writing, and is the UK's and indeed Europe's only literary magazine to focus on Caribbean women's writing. Following the death of Birch in 2015, who was the co-founder of Mango with, with Annie Mado, Annie Mado's work commitments increased, resulting in fewer publications from the publishing house. However, Mango has issued some valuable and important books to date and continues to give voice to its female collective. And so then finally, I just want to uh, give a, a brief word on the MA in Black British Literature that is here at Goldsmiths and that was formerly um, named Black British Writing. And so as early as 2009, Annie Maddow, and Annie Maddow was also involved in the, the formation of um, this MA as well. So as early as 2009, Annie Maddow's proposal for a new MA was initiated. At the end of 2011, it was reported that over 14,000 university professors in the UK, only 50 were black and overwhelmingly outside humanities disciplines. At the time, this was followed by confirmations that there were no um, black managers in British Premiership football, um, no sustained presence of black cricketers in the national team, despite the long standing presence of the West Indies um, team in the international competition, and in turn, by findings that no sustained promotion trajectory exists for black police officers into the higher ranks of the police service, even while black males continue to be disproportionately stopped and searched by white police. In the light of such a broader social context, the MA was not only timely, but necessary. Many established scholars of contemporary literature working in Britain, Europe, Africa and Asia, occasionally taught a course or two incorporating Black British writers, were doing research on Black British texts and publishing articles and books on these interests. However, the Goldsmiths MA in Black British Writing meant that the University of London would break new ground in preparing and empowering scholar specialists in this growing and exciting field of study. Like students who chose a sit-in protest against perceived racism, Annie Maddow contemplated action in the face of inertia or possible institutional racism. The challenge for her, she recalls, as a finely tenured but minoritized black academic was how to respond in the face of a demoralizing inertia especially since, as Pilkington notes, the prevailing pattern remains all too indicative of continuity rather than change. Having successfully negotiated quality assurance processes previously with the MA back in 2004, Annie Maddow and her colleague Dr Deirdre Osborne continued to fight the institutional obstacles placed in the path of delivering the MA. Concerns were raised by senior management, including feasibility studies, potential numbers, lack of funds for extra staffing, and so on. Issues that the institution should have focused on included college-wide diversity initiatives or historically underrepresented black and minority ethnic students or attainment gaps or diversity plans. Of this time, Annie Maddow writes, the background, as I perceive it, is a sustained narrowness regarding literary knowledge, especially in relation to Britain's imperial past, race, blackness, and ultimately who constitutes the human within the humanities. My teaching has consistently addressed this through courses that I've developed from 1999 to 2014, including an undergraduate module, Caribbean Women Writers, and a postgraduate module, Interculturality Text Poetics. From the first classes at either level, my practice makes clear that student participation in my classroom is vital for both teaching and learning. Within this context, students invariably reveal that they've had little or no opportunity to reflect on issues of race in most other literature classrooms. Whether this reflects ethnocentric bias or an exoticizing of post-colonial texts that sidesteps race, they insist, their learning rarely involves texts by black authors. What my white majority students appear to be to best appreciate in my classes might be described as an added dimension akin to preparation for world citizenship. For black students, the power of seeing oneself reflected on the page in the university classroom should not be underestimated. In 2015, Annie Maddow was still the only black lecturer in a department preoccupied with period courses, Victorians and restorations, for example, and united against threats of more contemporary literature. Canonical literature was a central concern. 
Yet long and varied experience of teaching and learning have not only inf informed her scholarship, resulting in an understanding of the classroom as a dynamic space for change. Minority literature specifically could play a crucial role by adding to the canonical while requiring students to rethink how knowledge, including the critical and theoretical, is produced, by whom and come to be valued. Black British literature, a contested field, promised to open up related questions, not only about literature and its values, but also about knowledge. And that's referring back to uh, when Huda was talking about um, knowledge production. So September 2015 witnessed the first cohorts of students to undertake an MA in Black British writing. So you can see that it, the concept started as early as 2009, but it took all of that time and all of that kind of internal fighting and politics before the actual first cohort of students arrived at Goldsmiths to take that, take the course. Such change involving humanities departments in an English university was unprecedented. Annie Maddow was able to position herself within the borderlands of literary studies and pedagogy, and despite reservations, articulated in discussion of the literary space as a site of struggle, in which still too few others are, in, are engaged, she led that historical change. As a marginalised black woman professor, one of only 25 in the UK, um, according to Nicola Rollock in 2019, despite inertia and opposition at departmental and senior management levels, Annie Maddow was able to lead curricular change. The MABBL produced a literature class of majority black and minority ethnic students, never experienced in our university before. The unexpected impact on the department by 2017 meant that they were delivering undergraduate modules, Black British literature and contemporary African migrant literature and film. Moreover, the transformation continues to influence our university's work towards equity, diversity and inclusion, as in September 2019, um, Goldsmiths launched its MA in Black British History. So where am I now? Having obtained my PhD, it was not my intention to join the ranks of academia. However, following Annie Maddow's retirement in 2020, I was asked to take on the delivery of one of the core modules on the MABBL. It was daunting at first, but the students are thirsty for knowledge and I have just started my second year. So I have been standing on the shoulders of the one and only black female professor of Caribbean literature and culture. And I hope that I will be able to inspire others to start that long journey and pave the way into the academy. Thank you. I'll try and stop sharing my screen now. Have I stopped sharing? Yes. Let me come back. Okay, sorry, oh, I, hope I, I hope I didn't race through that too much. No, that was, that was brilliant. That was very, very good. Well, congratulations to begin with. I mean, there are very, very few black academics, as we know, and well done. You're also doing, um, yeah, uh, this, this is really good. So I really enjoyed sort of like um, hearing about manga publishing, especially, and um, cultural translation and uh, translating cultures, because I, I work in, in translation as well although East African languages, Swahili, etc. So this was very uh, fascinating. We have only about 19 minutes for questions or comments or anything. So I won't take this time and start um, uh, sort of like my own thoughts. So if you have any questions, um, members of the public, please uh, do type them and I will ask. Um, Okay. So while we're waiting for this, uh, do any of you have any comments for each other? Maybe I, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, Marlene, yeah, do you no, want to I comment just, on anything? Yeah, oh, yeah. I just wanted to ask Huda and Arella. So how how long have uh, TBL thicker uh, black lines? How, how long have you been in um, existence? Yeah, I mean, we've been friends for many, many years and working together um, in different sort of capacities, but TBL sort of uh, as, a, as a, a, a name, I think you might recognize the sort of the reference. So uh, Lubina Hamid had a, as a Black British artist, Swahili actually, her, her yeah. father is um, uh, Zanzibari. From, from Zanzibar, um, uh, had a, a landmark uh, uh, show, The Thin Black Line, at the ICA, Institute of Contemporary Arts, in the 80s. And we 
Um, and to this day, it's sort of 40 years on, it's still sort of looked at as like sort of the pinnacle of, of thinking about Black British uh, uh, women artists. And so our work wanted to sort of think about what is this, this, this space, this gap between sort of all this activism that was taking place in the 70s and 80s and, and the kind of the, these breakaways into institutionality and yet you know, when we're, we're talking about things in 2017, sort of especially after the uh, movements around Black Lives Matter and thinking about the, the role of Black life in, in just generally and in the UK. Um, and so our group, uh, Thicker Black Lines, came together from, well, I don't know, I don't want to say too much. Uh, Arella, you're really good at making sort of a, a, a short synopsis of like um, how we came <laughs> just stop myself good flow but yeah I mean uh yeah 2017 is when we kind of formally came together in that way and it, and it culminated from um uh, a residency that Simone Lee had um at Tate um as part of Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter and and so from that there was an opportunity to um present our work um and she extended extended that opportunity to to um to uh, British artists and, and that's when we sort of came together um, even though as Huda said we, we had been working together previously. Yeah and so I, I think you might know the work of Simone Lee she's won I think it's uh, the Guggenheim and there's an amazing artist of Caribbean descent as well um, although she's an African-American artist she's of, of uh, Caribbean descent and um, but that that conversation that we're having is I think has echoed so much in, in your presentation of their mind in terms of sort of the the really in-depth work that people have to take on themselves and yeah. the lack of institutional support and um i what i really appreciated about your presentation is um we uh the academy and how does the academy create readers and how um especially given sort of the british academic system is so and and the publishing industry is so symbiotic uh, most of our publishing houses have a, either not a direct relationship with universities and university presses. Um, certainly, vast majority of publishers are from the sort of like the the, the literary um, graduates. Um, and yet, what what expertise do they they have out in in these institutions? And I think the um, uh, the MA course at Goldsmiths is sort of one space at addressing um, this 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 gap. And it's, but it's unsurprising that it's, it's, it took such a sort of a mammoth fight to create it. So, yeah, um, I can, yeah, I can, I can you're right. Can I ask something very quickly, which somebody had asked uh, previously. So you showed the book Passion uh, earlier, and I think somebody had looked it up and uh, it's out of print, but in the end they found it somewhere for 200 pounds. So thinking about that and also how, how Aurela especially talked about nuanced writing and nuanced reading. Could you know of, of anything that's been done for this book to become accessible maybe to our children or are they just going to be sort of like, okay, we see them on these presentations and, and that's it. Do you have any idea about how, how, how this book can be accessed at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that we sort of touched on is the kind of if you are fortunate enough to be in a position where you have access to a book, you've got a certain responsibility to, to share that with your peers and with your networks. And perhaps that's not what publishers want, but when a book is out of print or when it's um, financially inaccessible or it's in an institution that, that not everyone um, can have access to, then I, I do think that the responsibility is on, on those of us who who can disseminate that to a wider readership. And um, because a lot of these books, we ourselves encountered in that way. So we talk about kind of personal libraries and, and just um, word of mouth and that kind of circulation of knowledge. And that doesn't always happen within institutional spaces. Because I think if we're waiting for a publisher to remember this, out of print book from 1990 and to republish it you know we don't know if it's going to happen or not it would be great if it yeah. did and it's fantastic that it happened with the heart of the race um but there are so many books which which are still out of print okay so so maybe like is in like one way forward like in uh, so i think swahili we have this manuscript project um in the soas library 
where um, it is in like these old sort of like letters, books, manuscripts that are digitized and accessible to all. So maybe that's one venue that can be um, uh, looked up. Ludo, uh, I, I saw your hand, yes? Hi, just, just to let you know that there's Ludo, a sorry. comment on the, the Q&A. Would you like me to read it out, Ida, or do you want to read it out? Yes, please, yeah, I, I couldn't see anything. Yeah, go on. Please. Okay, so it's Leila Kassir who says, um, I'm not sure if this is a question, but I found it interesting that thicker black lines accessed out of print books for the reading groups via withdrawn library books. It makes me question the value or otherwise institutional libraries place on books and how community libraries are making them accessible and reinstating the value. So I don't know whether anyone wants to comment on that. First, I'd like to say hello, Leila. Leila is an amazing uh, librarian based at Senate House Library. So, um, and also a set of expertise around zine culture and zine libraries as well, and is doing excellent work. So, hello, hello, hello. And yes, so all I think uh, all of our copies of The Heart of the Race were ex library books. Um, and this is really in, 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 in response to sort of now we've had more than sort of 12 years of sort of uh, systemic cuts to public services and that this sort of the great activism that was taken by oftentimes librarians and community libraries to ensure um, diverse reading uh, material for um, their, 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 their uh, um, members. Um, and so uh, this kind of movement in the, in the, especially in the 80s and 90s to um, for uh, public libraries to be have more sort of like diverse texts and sort of literature for young peoples and so on and so forth. Um, it's very telling that um, these books, uh, many of these types of books are now on Amazon and some of them are, are very cheap. Sometimes, I mean, the copy that I had a part of the race, I got for a penny. Um, it was literally, it was, it was being sold for a penny and I had to just pay two pounds postage and packing, but that was it. And it was a, a part of this kind of mass dumping of, of a, a library that's no longer that it exists. It was um, a popular library is the stamp that I've got in my one. And so many libraries have closed in local authorities and have their texts have just been sort of sold up and, and moved. And so absolutely, I, I agree with Leila, the, the um, community libraries, libraries that have a, um, um, an, uh, a, 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 co a collection, a tutorial policy as to what the library is actually made of. So um, the, our library was, was focusing on the experiences of, of Black British women. Uh, and so that's why we collected this book. That's why we found this book because we had sort of an agenda. We were like, we want to know what the work and art of, these, of, of this community that we're a part of. And I think a lot of communities are responding to the way that the state has um, sort of consistently neglected uh, communities and a step forward and as Arella said if you have these copies you have I think a duty a responsibility to make that available to your community and so for our reading group we we just photocopied copies and we just shared it and said hey guys you know have it and we're very lucky now that Verso has taken up the rights and reprinted that and I hope that other um, publishers do the same um, but um, yeah no I, I, I entirely agree I think that um, we, as, as citizens, we have the right to make these demands on uh, institutions, but also I think uh, pragmatically, we have to be aware of the sort of the uh, systemic failures of these institutions to meet our needs and, and be dynamic and pragmatic in how to, to, to make solutions that are otherwise. Yeah. yeah, I think I can see a comment here by Lauren Latuli, who agrees with you. And she says that I know when I used to work on London, public libraries in Barnet, we used to, we would weed or sell off the books that hadn't circulated in the past few years, except for black and less represented authors. So um, there was some understanding of the importance of keeping the books within the collection policy. Thank you very much for this, uh, Lauren. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's really amazing. Uh, we have about maybe six more minutes. If anybody has any comments or any, any question, uh, you're more than welcome to to to, to uh, bring it forward. Yeah, I have a question for Marlene. Actually, um, yeah. I'm really interested in, um, I guess, your experience of, of with your students uh -huh. and thinking about young emerging budding right. Well, they don't have to be young, but 
<laughs> writers, writers, and um, the importance of, because we've talked about publishers and we've talked about audiences and readers, and I'm thinking about the importance of these kind of spaces for writers to have that time for thinking through their work and developing their work and, and taking on critique and just growing. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, well, one of the things that um, we've been fortunate here at Goldsmiths to have within the MA Black um, British Literature is that there's an internship um, in the summer um, with, uh, I think it's Hachette or Quercus, I can't remember the name of the publishers, but um, students on, on the MA can then apply. I think they have to, they offer two um, summer internships, which gives our, our students that experience of uh, being in the publishing house and seeing it from um, the other side and then also being able to maybe work on on projects and things and get insight into kind of their own you know if they if they're on the course um, because they want to then be writers we have we have a lot the students on the course are mainly they're either already um, teachers and they want to um, gain this information and then bring it back into the schools which is really good because it's like how and how do we get um our literature back on into the school system and onto the curriculum and then you have others who are they're either they're screenwriters or things like that and they they decided so there are already practitioners in their own right but they've decided to come along and take the ma because they want that kind of theoretical um background and the different ways of reading and understanding the different types of literature okay yep well, we have a uh, we have a comment from uh, anisha is it Pukadil? i'm really sorry if i said that completely wrong um so um, it's like Anisha says that I first want to apologize if being Indian Asian, uh, okay, for being, sorry, uh, Indian Asian, and it's wrong to take space over here. Well, I don't think you should apologize at all. Um, I'm really happy that you're here and please take space. Um, and she says, thank you so much for your insightful presentations. I wanted to throw a light on as an uh, Indian who grew up reading Alice Walker and Toni Morrison while not reading on the atrocities or minorities in my own backyard. I wanted to make a recommendation to bring Panther Paul publication and more, is it Ambedkar to the public and community library? and to throw light on the intersectionality of oppression. Maybe, okay, Farzana, uh, I mean, Qureshi, if you could just sort of like um, um, explain this to, to us a bit better, because I, I don't think I've, I've uh, read it very well. Farzana? No, no, sorry, Idra, I meant that I was going to read the comment. I think it's oh, probably sorry. better for Anisha to explain more of what she would like to, to suggest. Is she I meant... able to, to speak? Oh. I think I, is she not? No, she's not, is she? Um, no, no, okay. Well, uh, okay. So, I mean, so, as in like, I think Anisha wants to, to sort of like to uh, introduce this new, um, is that like a, pub, a publication called Panther Pause Publication? Panther Pause, yes. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, thank you. And I mean, I mean and, and I think she's referring to Ambedkar, which, uh, was, uh, was a thinker who, who represented, if I'm not wrong, of course, uh, the, the untouchables, uh, a particular caste uh, of people in India. Um, but I think if Anisha could perhaps, she could perhaps put it a bit more, expand a bit more of what she's, what kind of perspective she's talking about. Yeah, I think Anisha, if you could do that, it would be, it would be amazing because I, I, I don't think we're very familiar with her. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, uh, Ida, I just wanted to say, if if there isn't, a, I have a question actually for Marlene. Please, but please, I, please, please, please. So, uh, but just, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to you all. That was very inspiring. Um, Marlene, I wanted to ask, you was fascinated with the, 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 the programmes that you're teaching at, at Goldsmith. Can I ask um, how much uh, input or do you have or, or, or debate or say from students uh, participating in what is, is being taught on the courses or researched? Okay, so so basically, um, on a uh, termly basis, students are asked to uh, module evaluation. Okay, so they're asked to to feedback on the module that they are attending, and to um, input 
um, it, you know, if they think that there's a, a, a novel or a, a play or um, poetry that's come out that maybe they feel should be on the reading list, that's something that we take forward um, for the next academic year. So we're constantly, the um, programme spec is constantly changing with the inputs of the students, especially those that, because the course is offered uh, one year full time or uh, two years part time. Um, and so students have um, a chance to kind of have a look at what's going on. And between myself and the programme convener, we, we constantly look at um, new books, new writers that are out there that we can then kind of incorporate um, into the syllabus. And we work quite closely. We, we have a um, subject librarian who we can then say, right, you need to get copies of these books. We have come across the same things are out of print and, you know, we might have to have three or four copies that we can then lend to the students and stuff. Um, some people have uh, issues buying it from you know, a, a certain online um, provider um, who shall not be named. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, somebody was talking about how uh, we make these things accessible, uh, the things that are out of print, um, and maybe by, I think, uh, Ida, you were talking about uh, digitization, but yes, then yes. You, you get to, you come to the question of, um, in most cases, the authors are still alive. So what happens when you digitize mm -hmm something that they were supposed to be getting royalties from and this yeah, thing is yeah. now freely available you know there are all sorts of kind mm -hmm. of gatekeeping issues about how how we make um these books available but at the same time and i think i can't remember somebody was talking about the the value i can't remember somebody in one of the libraries was talking about i think she was talking about heart of the race and how you managed to get it for 1p but now it's been um reprinted and things like that. so there are kind of a lot of issues that um we have to in in some way look at um in yeah. terms of out of print material that is you know still relevant today but yeah students find it really hard to get yeah how yeah. do we I'll, I'll tell you what it's like um i, I often talk about this so not often like recently i mean guna won the, the award the, the nobel prize for, for literature and his books were nowhere his, his books are not there because all his books were like ex, ex library like you, you know what i mean it's like it was this kind of situation yeah. and um and then now probably, I mean, okay, they went from two, six pounds to 40, 50, 70 pounds during the first week. Now I think maybe they might be published a bit as so the rest of us can get them easier. But this is exactly the kind of situation that you're talking about. Um, this person is, is read by only a certain number of people in certain circumstances, and then suddenly, yeah, there's a need and there you are, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you very much, everybody. This was very, very interesting and fascinating. Um, I will pass uh, the button to um, is it Farzana who's going to close the meeting and thank everybody for, for coming. Well, you can but from me, thank you very much. It was lovely meeting all of you and I feel very honoured. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For coming along and inaugurating the Reading History of Family series. Um, it's, it's been great to listen to all your amazing presentations. And I'm sorry, I was on mute for a second there. I get really confused. <laughs> It always happens once, at least in a meeting. But um, yeah, thank you. You've been absolutely amazing. Um, and I just want to give you a round of applause. Yes, thank you very much. Um, that was just really wonderful. And as I said, so much food for thought. And um, I was scribbling away uh, all the names of the books. So I hope we can definitely acquire some of those for the library. Um, and we also want you to uh, please carry on um, tuning into us. Our next talk is already up uh, for, for November the 23rd. And that's going to be looking at uh, South Asian History Month. And we've also got um, uh, another speaker who's going to be talking about a project to do with the partition of India and Pakistan. Uh, it's a peace building initiative project. Um, so we're really, really excited about welcoming those speakers next month to talk about again, the, the South Asian narrative. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to it very much. And thank you. 
Yep, thanks. And I just want to give a shout out to Angelica Basquiera and Amapoku, who um, yeah. also helped us put this all together. So um, thanks, everyone. And thanks, everyone who who's shown up.